This is Echo 3, and let's discuss airplane design. This tutorial is going to get into some of the finer points of airplane design beyond the basics, and I would like to give Captain credit as I am basing much of this video off of his diagrams. Rather than starting by watching me craft a plane, I am starting with one that I pre-made. It took longer than I'd like to admit to get this design functioning well, so I'll spare you all of that and explain how this works. Mostly, it took a while to get the Cal 1000 and the Action Groups working exactly as they should. I am highlighting the center of mass and the center of lift. You can see that the center of lift, or more accurately, the center of aerodynamic pressure, is slightly behind the center of mass. This means that the lifting surfaces on the craft will center the upward force on that point and will cause the craft to want to slightly tilt forward during flight. But these indicators do not demonstrate all of the aerodynamic forces that will be acting on this plane. However, for the basics, this is enough to show that the plane will be stable enough in level flight. Now let's go more in depth about the forces that will be acting on this plane. If the wings were further forward, the plane would become even more maneuverable, like a fighter plane. And if it is even further forward still, so that the blue indicator is in front of the yellow, the plane becomes too unstable for controlled flight. If the blue is too far back, the plane will become too stable, like an arrow, and will be not able to maneuver hardly at all. Let's look at the main wings a little more closely. They are aligned using one tick of the fine placement tool. This increases the angle of attack of the wings. This is called the angle of incidence. This will result in the main wings producing more lift at the expense of increased drag, so that the faster the plane flies, more lift will be generated than if the wings had been merely placed straight or neutral. What this ends up doing is creating an ideal cruising altitude for a given velocity. By that, I mean the plane will naturally want to fly level if in the right conditions. As opposed to a neutral angle of incidence, the plane will always want to pitch down without any trim. Let's look at the wings and control surfaces. The main wing has flaps that I'll discuss more on later, and ailerons to control roll. Note that they are placed as far from the center of the aircraft as possible. Tail wings have rudders to help control yaw. I just saw a player make a plane with no vertical stabilizers and ask Reddit why his plane kept veering to the side. He didn't have any yaw stability. Lastly, I have elevators on the tail to control pitch. Surfaces that control roll and pitch together are called elevons. You can also use a control surface on the front of the aircraft to control pitch. That is called a canard. Pitch can be trimmed to help aid in level flight. Speaking of trim, I like to make planes that can be easily flown by just setting the trim and not requiring SAS. SAS is okay to use, I just try to make sure my planes can function well without it. SAS in the game isn't really designed for flying at a given altitude, so an autopilot mod works better for atmospheric flight. A quick word about wing shape. Kerbal Space Program's basic aerodynamic modeling doesn't factor in wing shape. So delta wings, swept wings, or straight wings are all equally valid options. If you want more realistic aerodynamics, try out Ferrum Aerospace Research. FAR is fun to use, and I found that I do a better job designing planes using it, because it isn't so gamey. Wing design that does matter is how much above or below the center of lift is in relation to the center of mass. Even though my wings are not in line with each other, the net effect is mostly in line. The higher the center of lift is in regards to the center of mass, the more stable the plane will be. The lower it is, the more maneuverable. Again, think fighter planes. A big issue I see with players that are new to making planes is the placement and size of the landing gear they are using. My plane is using a tricycle arrangement. This is great for most planes. There are a few other styles worth noting though. Sometimes for prop planes, a tail dragger configuration is good to keep the props from hitting the ground. A quad cycle can also be very stable. I like these for some of the survey missions around Kerbin where I have to land in some obscure location. Lastly, you can use a bicycle arrangement, but I haven't seen many players pull it off well. Make sure the wheels are placed level. On this plane, I placed all the gear on the fuselage and offset them to their current locations. That lets me ensure that they are straight and at the proper height relative to each other. Here, my rear landing gear are a little lower than my front. That helps me keep the props from hitting the ground. For most designs, keep all the gear at the same height relative to the ground. The space shuttle had its front gear shorter since it didn't take off from a runway and only needed to land. 
This was ideal as the shuttle would want to stick the landing. One last note about landing gear is to make sure they are able to support the weight of the plane. Players will make planes and wonder why it veers off the runway. Overloaded gear will angle a bit. The solution is to either use bigger gear, or in the case of an early career mode game, more landing gear. Just make sure they are all level. Let's look at the engines. I placed my engine sections on the fuselage instead of on the wings. This lets me adjust them separately for fine tuning the center of mass, lift, and thrust. It is nice to be able to be basically only moving one at a time. I'm using propellers, but the same principles apply as jets as far as the centers of mass and thrust are concerned. If the center of thrust is not in line with the center of mass, things get interesting. The space shuttle had to deal with off-center thrust and was designed with engines with a large gimbal range. You can see my space shuttle tutorial for help making your own designs. So as best as you can with your designs, try to keep your center of thrust in line with the center of mass. This may require engines to be tilted. I have a mod called Kerbal Engineer Redo and it has a torque readout to help me get my engines on straight. Also, be aware that as fuel drains, the center of mass can move. This is why I try to design my planes so that the center of mass of all the fuel is equal to the center of mass of the rest of the plane. Due to the role of the plane, this isn't always possible to keep this perfectly centered. So try to keep things close and be aware of how the center of mass will shift during the flight. Jet engines and the non-electric prop engines require atmospheric oxygen to operate. The engines I'm using have built-in air intakes, so I don't need these other ones. This was just an aesthetic design decision on my part. The different air intakes have different properties. Some are optimized for subsonic flight and others are designed for supersonic. For space plane SSTOs, the shock cone is usually the best option as one shock cone can provide enough air for four rapier engines when the plane gets up to speed. I have demonstrated how to design propellers in other tutorials, but this design is a bit more complex. My simplified designs only bind blade pits to throttle and have the engine running at full torque and RPMs. This design binds all three using the Cal 1000 to the throttle and I don't use an entirely linear setup either. The blade angle goes from 90 at zero throttle to 40 at full throttle. The propeller is still spinning around 10% at full throttle and with a little increase jumps to around 40% RPMs and torque. Those increase smoothly to 100% at full throttle. Note that I did decrease the engine size to 34. This plane doesn't need the extra power to spin these small blades. It would just be a waste of weight and fuel to have larger engines. As is, the plane is able to fly over 210 meters per second. That's 756 kilometers an hour or 470 miles per hour. Very few real life prop planes can do better than that. For comparison, a P-51 Mustang could reach 440 miles per hour and the TU-95 Bear can zoom at 830 kilometers an hour or 520 miles per hour. Some other things I have done with the action groups that will make this plane easy to fly are being able to turn off the engine and undeploy the propellers by pressing the RCS key. This is to simulate feathering. I bound the engine brake to the abort key because I like to keep it separate from the wheel brakes. The brake action group is also bound to my rudder air brakes. This can help the plane decelerate quickly. I have a couple control surfaces set up as a kind of flaps. They are bound to the landing gear action group and start off deployed. They increase lift and decrease stall speed while the landing gear are down. This makes landing and takeoff easier. Other action groups you may want to consider would be binding the closed cycle engine mode of rapiers or afterburners or the reverse function of jet engines. A quick note on drag before we leave the hangar. The drag model is very simplified in this game. It doesn't factor if parts are clipped or not. Parts in cargo bays or fairings are not factored. Attachment nodes are a big factor. Parts attached behind the node of another part will experience almost drill drag as long as the first part is flying straight. A mod like FAR will do a better job of factoring the cross sections of the aircraft and I prefer it, but this is a tutorial and I am playing with the stock physics. Now for a short test flight. You can see how the plane handles. It takes off very quickly and is rather agile. I'm surprised at how fast this plane is. It ends up going faster 
than the last time I tested it. This plane is a fun plane. Thanks for joining me on this discussion on airplane design.